So this, this is this is something we do for people who are get a creative block and can actually sort of basically have to break out of it. And it's based on a, a series of um, publications. So it's just called 15 Ways to Stay Creative. And so what these are, these are small 15 exercises that students can do at various points and it can sometimes help them. So we call them creative challenges. So number one, it's a, the, the, the thing to say is they all have criteria built into them. So this is a 24 hour challenge. So the student has to set themselves only 24 hours and that's the time frame. Then it's a, about collage design. And then the theme in this case is fear. So they have to spend 24 hour college challenge about fear. And we then show them some examples of people who use elements of, you know, fear within their work. So this, for example, is Hannah Hoch in the 1940s or from the Weimar Republic doing work using collage about fear, 100 years old, still really interesting. We then may reset the challenge and set it to say, you do the same thing, but on the theme of love. And again, what we'd end up doing is a, very, a series of pieces like John Stetziker, who is a, a found photographer. So he's a finds material, postcards and um, portrait photographs, and then you'll start to construct images. So this could be interesting. Or we suggest maybe they look at hope, in which case we would say maybe look at cutouts for Matisse. So these are just cutouts. So a slightly different approach to collage. So what we mean by this is the, the limitations are criteria, 24 hours, and the, the methodology is collage and it's various and different forms. And then there's several different themes. So that's a challenge that kind of shakes students out of different ways of thinking. Number two is they create an abstract image for an audience defined by you. And by abstract, we mean abstracted from another form, but the student has to define an audience. So here, the form this takes is kind of, you know, long kind of scrolls. And this is phantom landscapes. But as we get closer, we realize that this particular uh, artist is using kind of painting. But these are all photographs of, if you look in close, building sites. So the form and design comes from one source. And then the construction methodology is collage in Photoshop. But the audience is defined to understand how this may look and be used. Again, these are quite interesting. So these are just um, very small abstracted images. Um, of various things. The first one actually is just glass. The second one is quite interesting. That's a very nice, it's very nice beer, that one. And then the last one's um, white wine. So these are all macro photography where things are so small and then blown up to a scale, it changes the context. So you're redefining abstraction in various forms that can be used in other functions, whether it's in design, whether it's in kind of materials in terms of publicity, useful. Number three is slightly different you change the meaning of an existing advert. So the student has to select, or the tutor would have to select an advert and then change its meaning. So for example, this is the original iPod advert. So most people might be familiar with the form, the design, the silhouette, and the use of just a couple of colors, but that can be re revamped and reused. So this is an example of the same form being used for an anti-ear damaging campaign in New Zealand where you can see it working. And then this last one is the, the underground in London saying, be aware of pickpockets. So you're, you're changing the meaning of something that already exists by using semiotics that are in the public domain. So that's, again, that's a really interesting approach. Number four is to choose a painting, then rework it for a new audience and give it a new meaning. Now this usually works if the painting and uh, people are choosing is iconic enough for the audience to understand what it might be. So the example I'm going to use is The Last Supper, which, you know, I think most people might be aware of in some form, either from Leonardo's work himself or from uh, the Da Vinci Code, things like this. And then you rework the whole thing. So this is a, an editorial collage for a 19, uh, 1988 World Cup celebration. So an editorial collage using this form. This is a, a, fashion, foot, a fashion editorial spread by David LaChapelle for one of the magazines, I can't remember which. And this is just a cubist interpretation by Adam Lister. So the form, you know, the classical form remains the same, but it's got a new meaning because it's used in a different context. So whether it's to sort of promote the World Cup or promote a, a fashion editorial becomes interesting. So this is where you think, okay, what sort of paintings can you use? Most people might be familiar with the Mona Lisa. Most people would think, how will this work? This is um, for the New Yorker magazine in 1999. 
Monica Lewinsky was su supposedly having sexual relations with the president at the time, Bill Clinton, but it's reused. And because it's so iconic, it can be reused even to sell McDonald's, in this case in Sweden, for the DBB agency who put this work together. So this, this thing about choosing something and reworking it for a new audience and a different meaning. Grant Wood's American Gothic is then reused for uh, an advertising campaign for um, who's it? It's McDonald's. Again, the same with Van Gogh. So for students to do this, they can go and research elements of websites like adsoftheworld.com and they can find these informations. Number five is to create a set of stamps within your specialism and choose a personal theme. So what we have here is we're saying stamps. Most people don't use stamps these days, but some do. So we'll just <laughs> qualify that one. It's not email. And what you can do is you're looking at scale. So this is a, a set of commemorative stamps for Ellsworth Kelly. Now, these are giant abstracts you would see in a museum, um, but these are all reduced as, as commemorative. So they're very, very small. So we're talking about the use of scale here. So the use of scale and stamps means they're going to be no bigger than probably one inch, maybe, which is quite small. So, you know, two and a half centimetres by two and a half centimetres. So the student has to think about how you're designing these. So this is an example of Chrissy Lau designing a set of stamps for the Chinese New Year. However, it's for a small island uh, in this part of the UK, but it's a, it's a separate in some way, called Guernsey. So it's the year of the rats. And what we're seeing here is the scale of these. These are actually, as you see them on your screens, way bigger than it would actually be. But there's a limited color palette. They're also being used in a limited way, which becomes interesting. Number six is this. Create a landscape using only things within your home. So in other words, the student has to say, I'm not allowed to go outside this building. I will use what is around me. So this is an example of Carl Warner. And this is a series called Bodyscapes. Heavily photoshopped pieces of body that then begin to look like deserts and landscapes. Quite an interesting, simple idea. This is what he's more, most famous for, is producing these foodscapes. So these are small kind of sets. Actually, some of them are quite large. And what he's done is he finds things in the kitchen, and this is what he kind of makes a lot of his money from. So these are foodscapes. Everything you'd find in your kitchen to say, right, I'm going to make a landscape slash foodscape. So again, you're challenging the, the kind of students to think in different ways. You're also challenging them to think about what they can produce, how they can produce it, and scale. Again, really important. Only things within your home. So number seven, again, interesting. Uh, record your dreams for the next few weeks and illustrate them using any method. So this might take a little while. Um, and it also means that students had to sort of have a phone by their bed, possibly, but they do. So again, these are examples of different types of, I wouldn't say dream imagery, but I'd say imagery that kind of really kind of resonates with uh, dream-like making. So this is Odlin Redon, 1910 apparition using decollage, is drawing materials together. This is him doing Cyclops. So again, these look fairly surreal, but these are before the kind of surrealist kick in. Or you get people like Jerry Olsman producing these sort of photographic collages. These are all produced in a dark room. There's nothing digital happening here. Quite, quite interesting. And again, people like Gilbert Garson, who died a few years ago, um, brilliant photographer, but using elements of, you know, dreamlike materials Thinking about how you apply them is separate from thinking about how you construct them. So this is about the construction methodologies that you might choose to use to record dreams over a few weeks. Dali is the obvious one. So again, that's an interesting approach, an interesting challenge for someone who might be kind of having a mental kind of block to make it work. Number eight is this. Create a film poster using the same story but you're designing for three different audiences. So what we're asking the student to think about here are, the narrative within the film remains the same, but the application of that narrative to different audiences has to be understood. So the student themselves has to be able to say, I must investigate the cultural context in which this poster is going to be seen. So the examples I've got here are, this is Lawrence of Arabia. And we're looking at this as a kind of, I think it's the 40th anniversary edition. So it's a 1962 Oscar winning film of its time. 
Uh, we're then looking at the different form, an illustrative form. So an illustrative form in this way, or we're looking at an illustrative form for a French speaking audience. And again, a 40th anniversary version. So this is the exact same as the first one we see, but again, designed for different audiences or almost like a kind of print, like a screen print version. So the narrative remains the same, the audience changes, and the student's methodology, for example, if they're a photographer, a designer, a graphic yeah. artist, makes a difference. Uh, this is a good, a good example from 2001, 1968. You have this as one version of the original material, but then you also have another version. So again, these are designed for audiences to see these things in different ways. You then also have this, a, re a revised version where the film has now gone from being 1968, you know, quite radical cutting edge to being a classic, you know, decades later. So this idea of, you know, designing film posters for audiences, you must know the audience in order to know how you're gonna design for that audience. Number nine, is create a film poster or title sequence for your favorite film. Slightly different. By title sequence, we can mean moving image, animation, you know, it's kind of film parts, makes more sense, but you're using your specialism. So here we have someone, you know, James Jean looking at the shape of water, which is almost, you know, light pencil. Here we have split by Iziad Kadja. And what we're looking at is it's a very graphic, flat design, really interesting. Again, we're looking at how silhouettes are used and embedding into silhouettes. So this is Scott McEwan, Macbeth. So what you find is the design becomes interesting in relation to how the app, the student wants to sort of draw it together. But these, like Baby Drive, we're taking this form, 2017, but the style and design is much, much older. And this way it becomes interesting. A film like Mother, which is, um, you know, by additional designs, early additional designs, which is very graphic. So you're, you're asking here the student to look at what their favourite film might be and then look what already exists and then use their specialism to create something that works for them. Number 10 is this. We've done this with our students as recently as three weeks ago. We asked the student to bring in a piece of work and then what they have to do is exchange it with their fellow student. So they can do it digitally online. They can just swap it in various ways. And that acts as the starting point for the other student to create a new work. So they can respond to the first student's work, or they can use it looking at the style, the design, the content, or they can completely rework it. But it's, a, pardon me, it's a starting point. And I think that's a kind of interesting approach to also start dialogue with students so they can actually understand how each other works. So that's more of a kind of um, collaboration through participation. Number 11 is this, create a piece of work only using pixels or reflections. Now, what we mean by this is, the, the, the reason for putting this together is we're putting criteria and limitations in place all the time. So the student has something to focus on. So this is only pixels or reflections. So this is Chuck Close, American artist, and he's working on a self-portrait. And the way he works is he creates these giant materials that look, when you see them in a gallery or a space, from a distance, you see them as this form. But as you get closer, what they do is they break down into these abstracted pieces. And yeah, then you begin to see them as just individual abstracted pieces. But he's also produced some work like this, which is anamorphic portraits. Again, you have to see these using cylinders, but this idea of using pixels or reflections just to reshape how the audience might see things. Now, whether you use this in advertising or whether you use it in design, it's an interesting approach. So again, here, we've got people using Lego. In this case, it's Lego themselves um, to say, this is the Mona Lisa, or this is Grant Wood. So you think about how pixels can be used and what do you define as a pixel? Okay, so these are fairly straightforward commercial works to sell this product, but using kind of really well-known works of art, but Lego as pixels. Uh, this is interesting. From a distance, this is the head of Abraham Lincoln. And if you go into the gallery space, and I think it's Figueres, 
uh, from a distance. If you squint, you see Abraham Lincoln. As you get closer, it turns into a view, a back view of his wife looking into a landscape. Uh, but you have to bear in mind, this is 1976. And this is before we would call them pixels, although pixels were just starting, actually. Again, this is just a, a shot that I took of fractured work looking into an Anish Kapoor um, piece of work or looking at Andre Cartage distortion, looking at reflections. So all of these, nothing involved, you're just using reflections or pixels. Number 12 is this. Oops, there we go. So I'll stop that there. So this is to create an illusion. So this is um, a really interesting website with someone called uh, Brospup. And what it is, it's just using two pieces of acetate in order to make a moving image illusion. So this becomes interesting. If anyone's interested, go to the YouTube site and see how they do it. Really very, very interesting. But it's an illusion in a different way. So it's a form of animation that actually isn't really an animation, but it is. So again, this notion of what an illusion is. If you look at this, this is um, uh, wife and mother, mother-in-law, 1915. And depending on your point of view, you'll either see a young woman's neck or you'll see um, an old woman's nose. So this idea of what an illusion can be. So this is uh, Charles Allen Gilbert, 1892, talking about vanity. The, I think it's an etching, and I think I can't remember what it's for. It's an advert, if I remember right. However, it's been reused, and you can reuse these things considerably. So this same form of illusion is reused by Dior in 2002 just to sell perfume. And again, Dali, pretty interesting, looking at the disappearing bust of Voltaire. So you're asking the student to understand what an illusion is, and then the possibilities of making one that people might recognize or use. Number 13, interesting. Uh, create an album cover for a piece of music that you don't like. Now, this is sometimes difficult for students to do because they might not be interested in doing it. So what I would normally do is I'd choose a set of albums and titles and I'd give them to students and say, you have to do this. And the normal response is why? And we say, as a designer, your job is to design and you'll be asked to design things you don't necessarily want to do. You have to do it professionally and you have to take your skills and professionalism to it. So, for example, you know, have a look at the, I mean, these are albums that I quite like. That's not the point. But, um, you know, the techniques here, you're using pen and ink or you, you may be using flat graphics, maybe even some screen print or you're using multiple layers or you're using photography. But the whole point is, it's for something that you don't like. So what you're doing is saying to the student, you have to be professional and you have to take the, the best skills you have to it. If anyone's interested in doing it, I would advise all students to look at um, um, Studio Thorgerson because although he died a few years ago, the studio produced some of the most amazing designs for album and cover art over a kind of 30, 40 year period. Really interesting materials that deal with ideas. Number 14 is this. Use shadows and silhouettes to create a piece of work. So this, for example, I think these were um, 
Turner Prize nominees, Noble and Webster, and on its own, it just looks up, you know, so almost sculptural until a single piece of light is thrown on it and the shadow then puts in place what the objects might be about. Now, this idea, although this is a kind of fine art idea, it's appropriated. So everything I'm showing you to date will be used in many other forms. So this is the John Lewis Christmas art advert from 2007, using similar design, the same process as well. So interesting approach. Again, this is a different type of approach completely. This is by Red Hong Yi and what she's doing is she's using, the main theme is Star Wars shadow art, but she approaches it like this. So again, just being able to use shadows in a different way, this is Kumi Yamashita's approach to using numbers to create portraits or building blocks to create portraits. Really just interesting things to challenge, you know, how the students might think. And then lastly, we've got number 15, which is to create a pattern by using elements from nature. So you're saying we're now looking at repetitive or repetition design, but then saying you can only use elements from nature. So we then would show some examples, for example, you know, Escher, where things are, the lizards are getting smaller and smaller, or you've got the woodcut where, you know, sky to water, fish to fowl, um, or even, you know, William Morris. So the students then have to look and research some of these elements and then think about how can I apply the kind of thinking processes to, you know, essentially nature and pattern.